Welcome to the uh, ACT branch of the AIIA. My name is Heath McMichael and I'm branch president. In recent weeks, we've looked at China's rise and the impact on Australia, especially in defence and security terms. The growing tension between China, the United States and other countries is having a multifaceted impact on Australia, including on exports of our agricultural commodities to our biggest markets. Indeed, it has been a tough time of late for Australia's farmers with droughts, bushfires and the COVID-19 pandemic combining to slow productivity and disrupt supply chains. So what is the government's policy response to help Australia's agriculture sector retain its place as one of the most competitive and resilient primary producers in the world? Well, fortunately this evening, we have two decision makers from the two agencies at the centre of the Australian government's response to these challenges. Chris Tinning is the first Assistant Secretary, Trade, Markets, Access and International in the Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment. His division helps agricultural producers expand exports through bilateral, regional and multilateral engagement. Previously, Chris spent more than 20 years working for DFAT and AusAid on multilateral development, finance and APEC. He had postings to Jakarta and Washington and was seconded to the World Bank as an advisor. Now, outside his professional life, uh, Chris is a long-suffering Geelong Club <laughs> football supporter and has been known to belt out a number or two at karaoke. Michael Grouder, who on, who's online this evening, uh, thanks to some home quarantine, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to join us fairly soon. Was appointed uh, Assistant Secretary, Trade Expansion and Diversification in DFAT early this year. Before that, he was Deputy Head of Mission in Kuala Lumpur. Michael has worked uh, previously on FTA outreach and on Australia's trade with Vietnam while he was posted to Hanoi in 2005, 2007. Was also posted to Beijing uh, in 2012 to 14, where he was Councillor for Public Affairs. Before joining DFAT, uh, Michael worked at the Reserve Bank of Australia. He holds degrees in economics and Mandarin from the University of Queensland. For his sins, he barracks for the Brisbane Broncos. Eh? What is that? Like me, like. <laughs> <laughs> for the format tonight, uh, we'll have Chris talk for 10 to 15 minutes followed by Michael uh, for another 10 minutes or so. Uh, we'll then open for questions and uh, I'll create, curate those from those of you here in person and from those people online, submitting them through the Q&A function. So please keep your questions to the point and refrain from long comment pieces. We'll try to get through as many questions as we can before we finish at 7 p.m. So without any further ado, Chris. Terrific. Well, thank you very much, Heath, and congratulations on your re-election uh, as president. Um, and congratulations on a very efficient uh, annual general meeting. I wish all my meetings through the course of the uh, week were that efficient. Um, and for those of you who haven't heard uh, Heath belt out a uh, pretty woman, I would recommend having that on the agenda item for oh, your next okay. annual general meeting. Um, so thank you all uh, very much for the opportunity to talk. Uh, and I'm going to be doing a joint act with Michael Grader, who is hopefully online. Uh, and I'll talk briefly about the context for Australian agriculture, just sort of set the scene, uh, talk about some of the challenges facing our agriculture sector and particularly exports, and then just a bit about what the government's doing about it. And as he said, more than happy to uh, take questions. So in terms of the context, uh, if we could go to the first substantive slide, I'm sure um, next, uh, already been through my wonderful outline. Um, so yes, you'd be very well aware, I'm sure, that agriculture remains an important part of the Australian economy. It's particularly important in regional and rural Australia. Uh, it accounts for about 2% of GDP. It accounts for about 3% of employment. Uh, and obviously it's a backbone of many reg regional and rural uh, economies. Um, what you probably also know is that uh, our agriculture sector is very heavily reliant on exports. So about 80% of what we produce uh, gets exported. Uh, and therefore, any growth in the agriculture sector really needs to come mainly from exports. As my secretary says, who's quite a large man, 
we're not going to eat our way to a hundred billion dollar target. We're going to export our way to a hundred billion, uh, which is the target that the National Farmers Federation has set to grow our exports. We're currently at about um, Seventy-two billion dollars in production, and is a target to grow our production to a hundred billion dollars in farm debt by 2030. And the government has supported that initiative, and most of it will need to come from trade. So, if we go to uh, a bit of a picture of how um, agriculture trade has gone during the COVID period, well, it's held up um, pretty well. Um, so you'll see. Uh, in fact, this is the story of our aid trade. You'll see um, it's, uh, most of our um, trade uh, agriculture is exported, and you'll see as a percentage of our exports is actually quite high. It's between currently just under 15% of Australia's exports come from agriculture, uh, compared to sort of about 2% of uh, our GDP coming from agriculture. So it's quite a large component of our exports. So if we go on to sort of how um, agriculture's gone during the COVID period, um, so you'll see agriculture trade has held up really well globally. Um, so overall trade has fallen, services trade has fallen 21%. Um, if you look at um, overall merchandise trade, it's down about 13%. Agriculture trade's actually up uh, in volume, in value terms globally. And obviously people need to eat. Uh, and um, that trade has uh, held up really well, partly because prices are up. Uh, volume down slightly, but still far less uh, falling volume of agriculture trade versus other trade. Um, and a large, uh, this is a bit of a picture about Australia's main agriculture exports. So you'll see um, on the uh, left-hand side, it's the markets uh, that we export to. So. Um, I'll talk about China in a moment, but you'll see China remains by far our largest export market. So that's the uh, orange bar. Um, and you'll see Japan, USA, Korea, Indonesia, other major markets for us. Uh, and in terms of commodities, you'll see beef uh, by far our largest uh, export, although it's come down a bit as uh, farmers are restocking after the drought. Um, grains exports up Hugely, uh, we've had a really uh, good couple of seasons uh, with grains, uh, and they are now sort of about six billion dollars versus maybe about eight billion. So, uh, significant, um, significant to our uh, overall export performance. So, if we go to the next uh, chart and talk a little bit about how um, COVID has affected our agriculture trade. Well, as I said, trade overall has held up really well, but there have been some changes in consumer preferences that are obviously gonna impact on our trade. And an example obviously is the huge increase in online food sales um, globally. And you'll see from that chart, uh, they've really taken off um, post COVID, a, a gradual decline until COVID, and then a, a gradual increase until COVID, and then a really sharp increase post COVID. And that's got, uh, comes with huge opportunities for Australian exporters. Um, so if we go uh, on to a little bit of what's happening uh, with China, which I'm sure is the most interesting and topical uh, issue for you. Um, you'll see here a bit of a picture about um, our trade with China over time. So back in 1998, our trade with China was just 4% of our overall exports. And um, by 2019, it was 31%. So that's a very substantial uh, growth in our overall uh, trade, agriculture trade to China. And indeed that is higher than um, the highest exposure we had to Japan back in the um, 1990s. So uh, the, the peak of um, Japan exports as a proportion of our total exports, 26%. Uh, the peak of China as a proportion of our agriculture exports, 31%. So quite a substantial um, exposure to one particular market. Uh, there's obviously many reasons for that. One, China's entry into the World Trade Organization um, obviously um, resulted in a lot of growth in all trade. Uh, obviously, they have been a premium market. Many of the prices that uh, our um, producers get in the China market are higher than in other markets, even Europe and the US. 
Uh, and we've also obviously seen um, some, some disruption to other markets through growing protectionist measures uh, in markets like Europe that I'll talk about in a moment. So as well publicized, we've had significant disruptions uh, to some of our commodity trade with China. So this is a bit of a chart of some of the particular commodities that have been uh, well documented uh, over recent uh, months. So we've seen our wine exports uh, to China fall from uh, about $320 million a year to next to nothing. Um, roundwood exports from $147 million a year to next to nothing. Uh, barley from $264 million a year to next to nothing. Uh, rock lobsters from $91 million to next to nothing. And cotton from $91 million to $14 million. So you'll see there that all of those um, lines uh, for those commodities are heading south. Um, but we have seen some of our trade held up reasonably well. So you'll see there beef and veal, which is this line here, um, despite the fact we've had meat establishments suspended and that's been well documented in the press, um, our overall trade is holding up pretty well. And we've seen um, our, our wheat uh, trade, in fact, increase uh, over the past 18 months or so. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, so what, what's uh, Australian government uh, and Australian exporters doing uh, in response to these disruptions to China? Well, they've diversified. And that diversification uh, is actually happening pretty well. Uh, so our overall exports have held up despite the fact that there's a substantial decline in exports, agriculture exports to China, our aggregate level of exports uh, of agricultural products have in fact increased. Um, so a lot of that has gone to uh, Southeast Asia, you'll see up 19%, South Asia up 49%, Middle East up 34%, um, and even uh, Africa has doubled as an export market over the past um, 18 months. So we are seeing um, at least early signs of promising diversification um, in response to the disruptions we're experiencing with China. Obviously, that sometimes comes with a price hit for exporters. Some of those markets, the prices are significantly lower than the exporters were getting to China, but the value of that trade overall has held up really well. Um, our exporters haven't just had to worry uh, about uh, disruptions in China. We've also obviously had major disruptions to freight. Um, so I think you would um, well know from uh, the press that um, aircraft travel, particularly um, into Australia, uh, has significantly fallen over the past uh, 18 months. So we've seen about a 90% decline in passenger aircraft into Australia. And a lot of agriculture uh, exports went in the belly of passenger planes um, in the past. So uh, <laughs> around about 80% uh, of what we exported by air went on passenger planes uh, rather than on freight planes. So without those passenger planes and where they were available, uh, prices were incredibly high. Um, the, our exporters who relied on air freight, particularly when it comes to commodities like uh, seafood, which are obviously um, very hard to transport by sea because they die. Um, that, that was a real hit really early on when we saw this massive uh, decline in passenger travel. And I'll talk about how the government responded to that in a moment. Uh, but sea freight is increasingly also a challenge. So this is uh, just a chart showing that the prices of sea freight have increased very sharply uh, and are continuing to rise. Uh, again, this is getting more and more publicity uh, in recent weeks. Uh, and, and in fact, the bulk of our agriculture commodities um, do go by sea. So about 70% of our agriculture is exported by sea freight and increasingly it's challenging for our exporters to um, not only pay the increased prices, but also find containers that can um, transport agri our agriculture products. So let's move on to uh, growing protectionism, another threat uh, to our agriculture trade. Um, 
as a country that relies on trade, we probably rely on the global rules of the game more than almost any other country. Uh, and for those of you familiar with agriculture, you'll know there's probably more rules around agriculture trade uh, than almost any other form of trade. Uh, a lot of technical uh, specifications that countries uh, impose on ag agriculture imports. Some of those specifications are perfectly fair, they're for valid biosecurity reasons or to provide information to consumers that they need to make good choices. But some of those requirements are in fact non-tariff barriers to trade that are basically um, protecting domestic industries. Uh, and what we've seen over the course of the past um, decade really is a significant increase in non-tariff barriers to trade, uh, particularly uh, in agriculture. So it's no coincidence, um, I think that this comes uh, as tariff barriers are falling. So we've seen um, tariffs on agricultural products fall from an average of 33% in 1996 to 17% in 2018. So about a halving in tariff barriers to our agriculture trade, but non-tariff barriers have gone from uh, a total of 660 measures that have reported to the WTO to 3,290 measures. So a really sharp increase in uh, our non-tariff barriers that our exports are facing. And um, as I said, many of those we view as uh, not justified by science. Uh, so an example we're keeping an eye on is the uh, proposed carbon border adjustment mechanism from uh, the EU. Uh, it's certainly badged by the EU as um, a measure that's designed to drive better environmental outcomes uh, and, and protect the planet from uh, climate change. But um, we and other countries are concerned that in fact, uh, it's, it's a protectionist measure that is designed to protect uh, European farmers uh, and other European uh, producers. And certainly um, we're working in the WTO and other places to ensure that as the carbon border adjustment mechanism rolls out, that it is WTO compliant and it's not putting up a series of unfair barriers to trade. So just quickly running through, well, what are we, the government doing uh, about all this? Um, so I guess starting with um, export diversification, we understand it's really up to exporters where they trade and if exporters want to continue to trade to China, uh, acknowledging the growing risks, then we're fully supportive. But um, for those exporters who want to find new markets, given growing risks in trade to China, or for those exporters who are blocked into China, then we've got an initiative that helps them to find those new markets. And it's a joint initiative between Austrade and uh, my department, Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment, and working very closely with DFAT. So, uh, Michael Gratter, who's uh, hopefully going to join us, um, very much part of this initiative. And I won't go through exactly uh, what we're doing uh, under that initiative because of time, but I'm happy to during Q&A if it will be useful. Um, under that initiative, we've got a series of grants really aimed at those commodities that are most exposed to the China market or that have been blocked from the China market. And that's really helping build the industry to industry links that are necessary to facilitate trade. Um, and there's some examples up there of the grants we've given to date. Uh, I talked about air freight disruptions. So the government uh, introduced quite soon after um, COVID started a new mechanism that basically enables um, those exporters who can't get their stuff on planes to uh, get it on planes at a price they can afford. So under this scheme, which is very much a temporary scheme until borders reopen, we're really um, helping to correct for a market failure, which is planes are no longer, passenger planes are no longer flying, which is disrupting uh, freight availability. And we've really used the convening power of the government to touch base with exporters and try and work out where people uh, have needs uh, to get uh, commodities on planes and aggregate all of that and use the government's convening power to get as low a price as we can with the airlines. So it's, um, you know, people using this are still paying 
anywhere between 200 and 400% above what they were pre-COVID, but that compares to either not being able to find plane space at all or paying 10 to 15 times what they would have pre-COVID. Uh, and this has been very well received by uh, exporters. Um, and finally, we've got an initiative really designed to step up Australia's leadership in the international uh, institutions that underpin ag trade. Um, you'd be familiar with those uh, institutions on the board. You'd be familiar with the fact that many of them underpin the rules of the game that uh, drive agriculture trade. Uh, Australia um, has always been active in these organisations, but we feel now is um, a really important time to step up our leadership. Uh, you know, obviously it's well documented the US isn't quite as active in some of these bodies as it has been in the past. There are other actors uh, involved who are probably not running agendas that uh, go to the strengthening these organisations. So um, we are working with other like-minded countries to really try and step up our leadership. So I might leave it there uh, and pass to Michael. Yeah. Okay, um, building on what Chris has said there, he's given a really great outline of the dynamics and the trends and the plans for agriculture and where trade investment plays such an important part. I'll just go through, I guess, do a bit broader lens on merchandise trade trends over the last 18 months to two years. Some of it riffing off what Chris has said and a few observations from the data and what our business liaison as well um, has shown. To start with, um, you know, Chris pointed out that the last 18 months with COVID, natural disasters at the start of last year and the trade disruptions um, very prominently have all brought the issues of market concentration and risk into sharp focus for business and government alike. And so I'm gonna talk through, and we can go through a, a slide forward if you want to, Phoebe. Um, in what I'm gonna say, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about barley, building on what Chris said, then a bit on coal, and more generally just on what we might call a set of targeted exports. And finally, some thoughts on the commercial relationship with China. So first, the next slide, if I can, Phoebe. Um, yeah, so that's repeating the one that Chris had about barley, and that's exports of China to barley, as you've seen from June 2020, the grey area is June 2020 onwards, and it's gone essentially to zero. But if we flick one slide on, that's what's happened to barley to the rest of the world. There's been a huge surge. And, you know, when we've spoken to the industry, as Chris said, there has been a price premium because, or a price hit, because uh, China was the best paying market in the world. And the bulk of that has gone to Saudi Arabia, who pays about 30 to $40 less a tonne because they're using it for feed, whereas in China it's predominantly used for malting barley for beer. And so there has been a hit, but nevertheless, the bumper harvest of last year has actually been diverted to Saudi Arabia and a bunch of other countries as well. If we go on to the next one, I guess it's just to point out this was and I, I should say this is very crude, but it's just to give people a sense of the reconfiguration that has gone on. Prior to China's um, tariffs on barley, which we're obviously, as Chris said, contesting at the WTO, the two big trades, there's five big tra um, exporters of barley in the world, Australia, the Ukraine, France, Argentina, and Canada. If we forget the American two for the moment, prior to 2020, essentially, the big two trades were the Ukraine and France exporting to Saudi Arabia and Australia exporting to China with the two big arrows there. When China stopped that trade, next slide shows you sort of what happened. Suddenly, the Chinese, you know, and this is, this is the point, right? It's not just a one-sided transaction. When China says we won't take it from Australia, Australia can't export to China, but China also can't buy from Australia. So they have to go looking for elsewhere. They went into Europe in particular and picked up a lot of grain, a lot of barley from the Ukraine and France. And suddenly the traditional customer, Saudi Arabia, was sort of, what am I? What's happened here? And so they came looking to us very quickly. And that's just one example. And I know the head of Grains Australia I spoke to a few months back. He said, exactly. He said, I draw this map for people all the time where it just reconfigured. And that happened almost instantly. And so the big, the big part for us is... That was markets working and in a really important and interesting way. Next slide, if you can, Phoebe. 
And so that's the first point, I guess, the first observation. Markets can reconfigure, and they have done so. Bali's a great example. But as Chris said, it's not without cost or difficulty. You know, we're getting lower prices into those markets. We might not be shifting as much volume. Another example uh, Chris mentioned is uh, lobster, and it is only fresh lobster, I'll point out, um, not frozen or other. But um, now the price that is being got for that is about half what it was before. It used to be at about $90 a kilo. Now it's about $40 to $45 a kilo, and a lot is going through the um, suddenly new and important market of Hong Kong. Um, Next slide. So I just wanted to, going beyond the agricultural, is just to give another example around coal. So this is tonnages this time of coal, so actual volumes. And if you just have a look again, China down the bottom dropped away to zero. If you look at the green line, which is the rest of the world, it's gone up such that our overall tonnages of thermal coal to the world are essentially where they were before it started. In fact, a little bit higher. And we visited the Hunter Valley in June to talk to coal producers there. And if I can go to the next slide, I think it is Phoebe. The quote of the trip was that one. We said to them, how has it worked for you? And they said, after a short period of difficulty, the buyers came to us. And that was, you know, they said they were getting calls from Indian coal buyers from 10, who they hadn't heard from for 10 years. But because China had moved into their traditional suppliers, they had to come to us. So that reconfiguration we saw with Farley is also going on across a whole series of these other ones. Now, as Chris did, I would stress again, for the big globally commodity, uh, global commodity, undifferentiated commodities like barley and coal, that's a lot easier for, in, and you'd put them at one end, copper ore, barley and coal have essentially traded into new markets. At the other end, wine, lobster and timber have fared much less well because they are more differentiated high value or very specialised in the case of timber. And then beef sort of sits in the middle, as you all know, about nine or 10 abattoirs have been delisted, but there's actually about another 20 or so abattoirs that can still export to China. So it's a, it's a mixed picture and beef sort of sits in the middle. So that was uh, the story there. Yes, and just to show again, it wasn't just thermal coal, it's also metallurgical coal for steel making. China goes to zero, rest of the world picks up very strongly. Um, so that diversion went on again. And next one, this is the price story. And this is the difficult point. I guess when we spoke to the Hunter Valley, you'll see in the blue there, thermal coal prices got down to about $60 a tonne Australian, 50 US at the time. They are now over 150 on this and, go, and, and closer to 170 now. They've more than doubled the price of thermal coal in Australian dollars and metallurgical coal, not quite as dramatic, but still pretty high. So then obviously there's a lot of other dynamics going on there. But what's been really interesting is that, um, you know, China is now actually buying from higher cost producers all over the world, still in a global price. But we were told in the middle of the year that essentially China's moves had bifurcated the global coal market um, such that for, for metallurgical coal, Australia was exporting to everywhere but China at about $100 a tonne US. China was importing from other markets at about $200 a tonne US. And Chinese domestic metallurgical coal supplies were $300 a tonne US. So it had actually taken on itself a huge cost impost by doing what it did. Those in, in three months, those prices moved to essentially 200, 400, and 600. From, and so you know, the dramatic movements that this intervention in the market adversely for China are quite something to behold. So that's the point there. And I guess if you just want to go to the next one, Phoebe, overall, this is what coal, export, the value of Australian coal exports, so moving on from volumes to values. Our value of coal exports to China has been zero since late last year. The value of our coal exports to the rest of the world dropped briefly as the prices did, but with the volumes being steady and the prices rocketing, we are now exporting more coal to the rest of the world than we ever have. And Australian coal exports are essentially at record highs. Not quite what you would have expected 18 months ago when those things started. So a pretty interesting demonstration. Next slide, if I could. So building more broadly on that, then this is the, you might remember the treasurer gave a speech in early September, I think the 6th or the 8th of September, where he spoke a bit about this. And essentially the treasury colleagues put together some um, series of the exports that have been targeted by China. And so that's the one that Chris listed before, um, plus also coal and copper. 
And that's what that red line is down the bottom there. And you'll see it's essentially gone to way to zero. The only bit that's not zero is beef, really, that's still going. But the green line is those same targeted exports to the rest of the world. You will see, and obviously coal is a big part of that, they have boomed. And then the global total for those targeted exports, if you will, is now as high as it's ever been. So, and I think you'll see, probably pretty hard to see on your screen, basically China's imports of those from us have fallen from about $5 billion to about $500 million a quarter. Um, so they're down about $4.5 billion over that period, that 18-month period from June 2020 to September 2021. So, sorry, 15-month period. In the meantime, our exports of those same targeted products have gone up by $9.7 billion to the rest of the world. So we're in front by some 4 to $5 billion. So it's a pretty interesting demonstration there. Next slide, if I could, please. Maybe. So there's your third point. After a period of adjustment, markets appear to be working as you'd expect as the pivot is on, not costlessly, but they are working. Next one, please. And so that for us is the key takeaway. And it's something Chris said before. And of course, we both say it as good trade, trade policy officials, but the importance of open functioning global markets is underlined in no uncertain terms by all of what's gone on. You know, as soon as the barley producers or the coal producers heard that um, they couldn't export to China anymore, they got out their virtual Rolodex and called everyone else in their book and said, will you take a bit more product? But at the same time, on the other side of the transaction, global importers were going, oh my gosh, we need to call the Australians to get product. They came together and that's what you saw in that shift. So open functioning global markets have been a source of decades of prosperity for us, of course, but they're also proving themselves quite the tonic for non-market interventionist behaviour of the type we've seen over the last 18 months. Okay, next slide. I think this is the final one. So I will be very quick because the question and answer is always the best bit. Um, this, this is just on the situation with China. You know, as Chris noted, um, unfortunately, our assessment is that the situation with China is going to last for some time in this trade sense. And when people say, what are some time, men? we would say years, not months. And that's obviously been going on for a while now. Would that it were otherwise? Of course. But China's clearly made a series of decisions aimed at seeking to use trade to pressure us politically, although the charts above would have you consider whether this is actually working or not. In the trade space, however, and to repeat a point Chris made, we're very careful to emphasise emphasize that we, Australia, are not seeking to move away from China, quite the opposite. And so you'll see here in, in this chart, you've got the targeted ones we spoke about before, the red ones going to zero, and then there's two other big categories, I guess. There's iron ore, which is the large orange one out on its own, and then there's the rest, if you will, all the other stuff we export to China. And this is just merchandise, I should stress, not, not um, including services. But if we look at those three categories, okay, the targeted exports were running at about $5 billion a quarter, so $20 billion per annum. Iron ore was about $20 billion a quarter or $80 billion per annum rate before COVID and everything. And the rest of what we sell to China in a merchandise sense was and remains at about $10 billion a quarter or $40 billion um, per annum, twice as large as those goods targeted. And that ignores services, you know, tourism, education, et cetera, which in normal times, although when that might return is another question, run at about $20 billion. So if we just look across that suite of things, we export prior to, the, to, the, to COVID and the trade strikes about $160 billion worth of trade to exports, sorry, to China each year. Only, in inverted commas, $20 billion of that has been targeted by China. $140 billion is unaffected. Okay, iron ore, a unique product, is very big. So let's take that out. It still means $60 billion is untouched in our mer merchandise and services trade by China doing anything. And when we speak to um, financial services firm, high-value health manufacturers, um, beef exporters that aren't out of those abattoirs but might be doing mints to China or something, they're having no problems whatsoever. So all of that is a long way of saying China remains a very important commercial partner for us, even with the trade strikes. And our future prosperity is in part tied to that relationship continuing and growing, just as China's growth and development is tied to us. So that's why the government's 
very keen to engage at senior political levels because it's in our mutual interest to do so. And so our advice to Australian business, as Chris said before, is when the question of an approach is raised, is to encourage them to continue to do business with China, but account for increased risk. That should be on their radar firmly. And our business liaison has backed up the numbers in those earlier charts. As I said, where you talk to anyone working in any of those other businesses, and indeed their business is good and growing with China in many circumstances. That's as we'd hope. And we look forward to that good business also having the chance to one day extend back into the other areas of mutually beneficial trade that are currently being prevented from reaching their full potential. I think that'll do me. Hand over to Heath for questions. Thank you. Yes. Well, well thanks to Chris and to Michael for a uh, wealth of information there. Uh, just encourage people online to uh, send in their questions and uh, while uh, they're thinking about those and the people in the room here are thinking about theirs, I might get in with one question. Um, Chris, you mentioned that diversification is leading to different markets of the world getting uh, uh, an increase in exports of Australia's agricultural products, but I noticed that Southeast Asia, our own neighbours really, have got a fairly modest increase of around 19%. I suppose that's an aggregate figure across a number of commodities. But my question is really, uh, shouldn't we be uh, a bit dissatisfied with a fairly low figure like that, given that uh, you've got uh, mid middle class, uh, burgeoning middle class in these countries, merging uh, uh, economies of Southeast Asia, um, and, and their, you know, their tastes uh, for um, you know, processed food and so on should be going uh, more in line with what we can produce. Well, is there something wrong there? Well, 90% growth in a year is not bad. Mm. I'd take well, that. Well, there's a comparison with but, the, but the yes, Africa and the I, UAE. I take your broader point. Mm. I mean, obviously, it's a pretty mixed picture. That is an aggregate. Um, Vietnam and Thailand are up much more sharply, uh, mm. sort of 70 80%. Indonesia is probably the, the drag on that average. And that partly relates to COVID because, you know, Indonesia has mm. been very badly affected and that's affected demand for a lot of our products including in high-end hotels, et cetera, which are closed. But it's also partly about, um, I guess, a protectionist sentiment uh, in Indonesia that we sort of are struggling to, um, to overcome despite IACEPA, our new trade agreement. Uh, we've still experienced some disruptions to our trade, including in commodities like grapes. So I think we're hopeful um, that sort of the, the mutual interest that um, and a growing egg trade would bring uh, will, will lead to that uh, increasing over time, but um, but but it's not easy. Okay, thanks very much, uh, uh, John Karen in the audience here for Minister for Agriculture. Uh, John, would you like? To... Thank you. Um, commodity markets always work. You know, there's always a commodity price, um, but when you get on something like wine, I think we're in a whole different area. But and more generally, in terms of China's reaction, how much of this is um, related to the trade war with, want a better word, the United States and need to balance? And does the Belt and Road thing come into it at all? Well, it's definitely a Michael Crowder question. <laughs> all right. Michael, how, you're not dead yet, we know, so. <laughs> That's right. Um, I think, you know, there, there certainly was a lot of thinking about whether some of this was a convenient way to open up space in the Chinese import demand for US products that they had um, committed to take. But there's also not a one for one identity between what they committed under various phase one deals or whatever they were called, and what they've struck at in Australia, there was some but not all. And I guess uh, cotton's a fascinating example that's also done quite well. Um, you know, China China said no to Australian cotton, and that was part of the phase one deal. But what has happened since we understand from talking to the industry with Chris and others is that um, Chinese cotton mills in Vietnam have picked up all of the Australian cotton that was going to China before, and they're milling that instead and then sending the textiles on to China. So we're still sending it through to China eventually. It's just going by a different route. But it's hard to say with any certainty that the US-China trade deals or trade war played into this. There would be some, I'm sure, but I haven't seen anything definitive suggest it's all about those. Um, on the BRI, um, John, did you mean in terms of 
uh, well, I guess, what, what were you thinking in terms of the BRI's influence on this, just to ask a bit more? Ukraine, Europe. Sorry. Yeah. Um, um, I, Ukraine, Europe, you know. I can't imagine so because um, it, it seems, you know, it, it was the Ukraine, but France as well and Canada too. Um, you know, they all picked up a bit of a bit of um, what China was wanting, and France probably picked up more than the Ukraine. So there was no sense of payback or not for particular BRI things that we could see. No sort of systematic pattern of they looked around and said this will both hurt Australia and help people we want to help in other ways. Um, it, it didn't seem to match in that sort of way. Thank you. Yes, I've got a question from Paul. Um, Paul McLeod, retired. Um, I was struck in the presentations, which were published in excellent, but there was one three word slogan that I didn't hear free trade agreements. I was really struck that um, if one goes to a, a session about Australia's agricultural trade over the last 20, 30, 40 years, you would hear talk about free trade agreements and what they meant for Australia's agricultural trade. So what is the place of existing and prospective free trade agreements in the outlook for our agricultural trade? Yeah, well, obviously um, they remain very important, um, in, including obviously the new ones we're negotiating. So we've got some really good prospective um, growth through the UK. Um, agreement in principle and if if that is realized um, that's a really great outcome for our agriculture exports the eu is obviously one we're trying to um, progress uh not easy but uh, a very important one a very high value market if we can land it um, but obviously the north asia agreements were, were hugely beneficial for australian agriculture and a lot of the growth we've seen over the past uh, five or six years are on the back of those days so yeah, I, I think it probably a fair fair uh, point that uh, it could have featured more prominently in the presentation. It's a bit cheeky, right? Yes. <laughs> and I, I think just to add to that, yeah. I mean, yeah. with with the EU and the with the UK close to conclusion and the EU in the negotiation, I don't know what the coverage of agricultural trade will be once they're done, Chris, you may, but certainly of our overall trade, it's upwards of 80%. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Over 90. If yeah, we, over if, 90. And so were. in a sense, um, one might argue that the dance card is almost full. Um, and, and so 20 years from, from SAFTA um, all the way through to RCEP and the t CPTPP plus the UK and the EU, will have pretty much done the job of liberalising through that because, you know, Chris talked before about the average um, global agricultural tariff barrier, um, but obviously the effective tariff barrier against Australia is vastly lower because of our FTAs. It'd probably be close to 5% or something if you looked at it across the sweep of the FTAs because it's knocked off so many things, you know, into China, our biggest market in particular, but Japan and, and Korea as well. Not everything, but it's substantially lower than that global average. Uh, so the in a sense, the um, the work is done in a tariff sense. Of course, that then makes non-tariff barriers even more prominent. Um, as one economist famously said in 1970, when you drain the swamp of tariffs, you suddenly find all of the old car bodies and wire and mesh beneath the surface that you couldn't see before. And that's what we're increasingly seeing now. So. Okay, thanks, Michael. Can I just uh, ask a question about the, the multilateral sphere as well? You, you had up your slide with the WTO and uh, various other uh, organisations. So, uh, what's your honest assessment about how, how useful uh, work in the multilateral sector is to Australian exports uh, growing or diversifying? I mean, there's a history there of, you know, subsidies and protection that uh, the WTO and so on's predecessors have been party to, really. But is, is, is that something that, is that an organisation, is that a forum where uh, we can really um, seek to grow Australia's exports at the moment? Well, I think from our perspective, it's about protecting 
uh, our exports. Because as, as Michael noted, you know, these, these markets um, rely on rules of the game. And if the rules of the game aren't abided by, then we're all in trouble. But Australia's in more trouble than most. Mm -hmm. So I think from our perspective, um, as I said before, investing in these institutions that have underpinned that order um, is a top priority. And it, it's less about sort of, I guess, removing tariffs, and it's more about ensuring the rules of the game are protected. Yeah, and there, there will be, I think, Heath, gains, you know, at the margins or in sectoral things, you know, like the digital economy or fishery subsidies, you know, really, really important things like, you know, our Pacific neighbours need the fishery stuff to work or they'll just keep getting uh, pillaged uh, by massive fishing fleets from elsewhere. But I, I couldn't agree more with Chris and the barley example is an example, right? When, when they got stopped in one market, if the WTO wasn't there covering 98% of world trade and saying it functions in this way, they could not have moved to other markets and saved their businesses like that. So it, while as a negotiating institution, its days may have, um, you know, those big rounds of before one would suggest that would be hard to envisage. But as a rules making body and rules maintaining body, as Chris said, it's, it couldn't be more important for Australia. Okay, thank you. Now, Dennis, have you got a question? Then we'll get to you. Did I hear you right to say that prices of the game in parts, for example, are lower than what we had in China, so that we've maintained the dollar values by increasing volume? Is that right? No, no. The, the prices we would have got had we exported to China are lower uh, in these other markets. But overall, global prices for agriculture products have increased sharply. Uh, so it's it's largely a price story that our agriculture has done so well in the COVID period. But um, the prices are lower than the China price. Does that make sense? We made up the gap by volume. No. No, so it's a price story, but it but it would have been an even sharper price story if we were exporting to China. Yeah. Okay, Alistair, do you want to yeah. Thanks, thanks, Heath. Um, Michael, I either saw or imagined a report recently of China. Sorry, uh, Alistair, yeah, yeah one more. Uh, Michael, I either saw or imagined a report recently uh, <laughs> of China threatening um, imports of iron ore from Australia. Uh, if that were to come to uh, anything substantial, do you envisage the sort of successful market diversification that you and Chris have described in relation to other commodities? Put simply, no. <laughs> it would be impossible uh, because of China's position as the dominant global supplier of steel. Um, but that, that sort of uh, two-way knife's edge we're sitting on there um, means that if China were to do that, it has no other short-term replacement supply. There is no one else that could replace it in the way that Bali was able to um, from other markets. And so China would actually be putting out of work hundreds of thousands of steel workers and all of the downstream industries that flow from that. Um, you would find it hard to believe that they would do that. Okay, RP, uh, next one, yeah. Um, thank you for your presentations. Uh, I have you just to introduce to, yourself. Uh, I'm RP Sixaria from Content Group. Um, I've got a follow-up question to Heath about the uh, multilaterals. Um, in some of the events recently, uh, there's been discussion about um, minilaterals um, playing a bigger role uh, increasingly. Uh, in the geopolitical arena versus multilateral institutions. Is that how you see it would be for agricultural and, and trade um, as well, about the multilateral institutions playing a bigger role um, in the coming years? Yeah, I mean, a lot of um, <clears throat> agriculture trade rules emerge from subgrouping agreements. So, you know, something might be, a standard might be agreed in APEC, or amongst a, a subgroup of um, those who, um, you know, then get engaged in broader rules debates in organisations like 
the IPCC and OIE, I won't go into all the acronyms, but a lot of the agriculture rules of the game are governed in sort of bodies below the WTO. Um, and those rules of the game often emerge from what you could call minilaterals. We don't call them in the, in the agriculture space, but yes, is the short answer. And we are working heavily with what we call like-minded uh, players around reforming some of those rules of the game in the, in the post-COVID era. So we might be able to sort of use some new technologies that have been proven uh, to sort of streamline some of the requirements around agriculture trade. And we're actively working with that, uh, particularly with Southeast Asian countries who are open to it. One of the best mini laterals on agriculture has, of course, been the Cairns Group. So, you know, it's played a huge role in those things. But Chris is exactly right. Um, when the large multilateral institutions are finding it hard sometimes to push ahead, pathfinders or small groupings or ginger groups or whatever have always been the way to do these things in trade and every other international forum besides. So it's, it's going to be ever thus that um, small groups get together and do that as well. So it'll certainly be part of this. All right, Amanda. Amanda, <clears throat> Amanda Lynch, ICT Council. Um, I'm just interested in, in the US. I see American imports um, from Australia are actually increasing. So what are they mainly uh, comprised? And also, is America continuing its very aggressive protectionist stance as was under Donald Trump? Uh, we haven't heard much about it lately, so his guidance sort of softening out a bit. It sounds like one for you, Michael. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, uh, I must admit, I am not following US trade um, data all that closely, so I couldn't sort of say exactly what the in and out figures are, sorry, on that. But on your second question, I think you... Yes, there are certain things that the Biden administration is keeping in place that the Trump administration put in place, like the phase one deals with China and that. But there are also other protectionist measures, such as the steel and aluminium uh, issues they were using, and the Airbus Boeing type things that they were doing with the EU and certain other partners like Canada that they are quietly or loudly removing. So you would say on balance that um, a year in, the average level of um, effective protection ism in the US is lower than it was a year ago um, because they're quietly taking away some of those things that were levied on traditional partners, if you will. But I'm sorry, I can't tell you about the, the trade stats specifically. Ernst, yeah. Ernst yeah. Wilhelm, a member of the ACP branch. I'd be interested to hear to what extent there are controls and monitoring of Australian exports. I ask it in the context of reports that there's been a boatload of Australian live lobster going from China. You may not be able to comment directly on that. Um, my interest in the area probably goes back 50 years when we had sanctions against southern Rhodesia and tobacco was appearing in all parts of the world, which was thought to come from Southern Rhodesia and had full certificates of origin. Now, I think over the years, there's been a lot of work, partly in the context of sanctions on certificates of origin, tracing back where product comes from. Uh, I assume that when lobsters or anything else is exported from Australia, there is an export permit. Uh, but I'd be interested to know whether there are any systems for following up what happens to Australian product that is exported. Mm. The, the short answer is at the moment, not much once it hits the border of the country to which we are exporting. So there, there's certainly um, a very clear uh, pathway until it hits the port. Um, but after that, at the moment, not much. So once it lands in Hong Kong, where it ends up, we don't really trace. We are doing quite a lot of work now on thinking about how we better trace Australian exports because there's a potential premium for us if we can sort of prove that that steak on the plate uh, in a third market is in fact an Australian steak and not a piece of Indian buffalo. Um, that, that is a work in progress and, and, and we're sort of working with CSIRO and others sort of who, who can trace these things through DNA technology, et cetera. Um, but I think we're, we're a few years away from that. So at the moment, um, 
once it hits the port, uh, we sort of lose sight of it. Any other questions? All right, uh, uh, all right, John. Okay. So I was only going to say, um, I was only going to say, I was trade minister in 92, in 93, and uh, so I'm an historical relic. Um, but I regarded the free trade, there's no such thing as free trade, and I thought most of the agreements we've been doing are preferential agreements. But the problem is, and quite a sanitary rules, all these non tariff barriers are only just starting to move there. But um, uh, people can walk away from these agreements, and you know, then you go to the WTO, and it takes years and years to get something through. So it's a, still a hell of an area. That's all yeah. I'm saying. I'm just making a comment. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think That's fine. We would agree with your comments. <laughs> <laughs> Last word, Brian. Yeah, Brian, the uh, council member. Just, yeah. just a sec. Um, We've got the microphone. The, um, yep. Australia, I think, has taken um, China to the WTO over Bali. Um, given uh, China's history, we're aiming to the South China Sea, where you have international forums saying these are the rules, and China saying, well, bad luck, we're not going to abide by them. Do you have any real hope that they will take notice of the WTO? Well, so, I mean, Michael might want to comment on this as well, but I think our, our impression so far is China is interested in maintaining a good reputation in the WTO. I mean, they've obviously benefited hugely from being a member. Uh, and I think uh, Michael could comment, but the, in terms of the WTO related discussions, they sort of so far engaged at least consistent with the process. Correct. And, and I think also just as an indication of that good citizen thing is that when the WTO was getting to the point in the last couple of years where the mandate for the appellate body was running out, China was a constructive participant in the alternative process that has been set up that's now going to be hearing some of these things. So China has has said, yes, we st should still have a an ability um, a jurisdictional ability across these things, jurisprudence ability, sorry, across these things, um, you know, where the US was saying we will not, China was saying, no, we definitely need to be able to do this. So just as an indication of um, some intent around retaining rulemaking powers and, and um, judiciality, that, that's an interesting one too. All right. Well, we might uh, draw a line under that. I know Chris has got other engagements to get to. Um, and But first, let me say uh, thank you so much for a very comprehensive... Uh, ...mentioned Chris, the convening power of government. Well, I'm sure that everyone will agree that uh, uh, Chris and Michael are representative of the strength of the Australian government's convening power uh, bilaterally, regionally and multilaterally. Before we finish, um, let me remind you uh, that the next ACT branch event is in fact our Christmas party. And thank goodness for that. The last event of the year. I'm pleased that uh, former DFAT Deputy Secretary Gary Quinlan will be our guest speaker and his topic should be highly entertaining. It's what a wonderful world, where are we heading? Now that uh, Christmas party, uh, ladies and gentlemen, will be on Tuesday, the 7th of December, from 5 p.m. We're going to start a bit early. We'll have some special Christmas fare so that we can enjoy it before Gary's presentation. And um, so I encourage uh, people to come along in person to enjoy that, uh, to mark the occasion. But we will also have online registrations. Now, before I finish uh, and before Chris runs away, oh. This is a small token oh, of our appreciation. Thank you very much. All that up. So <laughs> part of our merchandising, but you don't have oh, to pay. That's right. <laughs> so until we meet again, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks again, Michael. Thank you. Michael. Thank you.